But, you know, it made me really want to go home and just hug my baby even more, man. I was like, wow. I, I saw this, this moment in the movie right here. This right here. And I went home and just tried to recreate the same thing right there. <laughs> where she's just kind of like, get off me, Dad. <laughs> this is embarrassing. This is weird. It's creepy. Are you come, looking in my ear? Yeah. Hey, come on. Let's do, let's do the goose and robot thing. Come on. Come on. Let's do it. Yeah, just... <laughs> Up, Dan. <laughs> a big birthday gift for me. For my birthday's next month. Mm -hmm. A big birthday gift for me is you came out to see the one year anniversary of me doing sit down comedy at the Broadway Comedy Club. Going to be back in the Red Room September 27th. Oz will join me later if we used to just sit down and just lot of gag with the audience. And then we're going to have all of you up for open mic. And that show, again, is going to be 9 p.m. at the Broadway Comedy Club. That's a Friday. Get your tickets now by going over to broadwaycomedyclub.com. This has been a pretty good summer for the animation. Yeah, out a lot there. of cartoons. The cartoons have been pretty groovy this summer. A lot of animation's <laughs> been going on in the cinema and a lot of us been pretty nice. A lot of us been pretty quality. And we have another one that's about to enter the mix right now. And that is, oh, he about to wild. I'm sorry, she. Get it right. How sexist of me, you know. <laughs> that robot don't have any boobs or anything, so it's just kind of hard for me to. I Very know. sexist. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I'm trying. Body I'm, shaming a robot. No, I'm not body shaming at all. You can be just as non-sexy as you want to. No. <laughs> be all the tittyless robots you need yeah, to be. You want to run around, you know, with them damn big hips and shit, fine, whatever. I don't care. No, people, people, this is uh, the wild robot. And that robot be getting a little bit of buzz out here. A lot of people have been looking forward to this because it's also based off of something, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But, uh, you know, I didn't really know much about this until I saw the movie. Uh, I almost don't want to tell you anything about it. So, you know, hey, listen, if you want to cover your ears for a little bit, or I'll describe this movie, that's fine. I'm not going to be spoiling anything. But I'm just saying, going in kind of blind and not knowing anything really surprised me with this movie. Whether it's for better or for worse, we'll talk about that. But as far as this plot goes, without giving too much away, uh, this movie centers around a uh, robot that was created for servitude. Mm -hmm. Kind of like Wally. Oh, I thought you were gonna say kind of like slavery. <laughs> <laughs> no. 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 I was not going to say that actually. Uh, uh, well, whether you see it as servitude, Wallytude, or slavery, uh, this robot was created to serve to the point that she can't do anything until she finds a purpose, somebody to help. Uh, but she gets lost in this storm and in, she lands in the middle of the forest where she discovers the ultimate task as she's searching for something to do. And that is being a mother. <gasps> I know, I know one of the most important and hardest jobs out there. And she's new to the world. Mm -hmm. How she's not, you know, she's new to the world, how much less motherhood. How is she going to be able to do this? But she does this because she finds herself being imprinted upon by a little little baby goose. And the little goose has been orphaned. So she has no choice but to try to raise it. Can't just can't leave that cute little thing out there by himself. No. Who you do what kind of what kind of person, much less robot, could do a thing like that? <laughs> and you know, being a mother is challenging, although sometimes it has its rewards as you can see right there. But the thing about her being a mother is that she now finds herself being led into a bigger purpose as a whole island of animals out there come to depend on her as well. Oh, look at that right there. Big happy family. <laughs> One big happy family. But of course, if a movie was just happy like that, we wouldn't have a movie. Nobody <sighs> wants to sit up there and be happy for the whole time. We need, oh. we need conflict. Oh, yeah. We need tension. Yes. And hopefully by the end of it, with the right combination of all that, we'll be entertained, were we? Well, let's go ahead and take a look at this trailer for that wild robot. This is actually based on a series of books. I was wondering. Yeah, it's a 
three. It says, of course, you got the wild robot right here written by Peter Brown. Now, if I can just kind of move those books out the way and look behind them, you got um, the, <laughs> the, 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 the wild robot protects and also he escapes. So I haven't read any of these. I didn't even know they existed. That makes sense, though. DreamWorks, that's like their bread and butter because Shrek was originally based on a book, yeah. too. So it was uh, wasn't, uh, How to Train Your Dragon. Wasn't it that big? It might have been. That one I don't know for sure. But I, I know don't know Shrek for sure. Was. But, you know, that's uh, that's nothing unusual for a studio that does animation to actually uh, use some other, uh, other source material, especially mm -hmm. for a studio. You look, you know, I don't like to take risk a lot of times. So if there's something successful out there, like a book or <laughs> some other existing property, they'll go ahead and take it. And the books must have been very good because there's three of them and the studio want to make a movie of it. Are they like kids books or are they like regular books? That's a great question. I don't know. I, I don't know. if I'm sure that they can be read by kids, mm -hmm. but I don't know if it's one that, you know, uh, it's like YA or something like exactly. that. Exactly. Is it like a YA novel or is it like a picture book? That would make a difference. Like, is it 70 pages or like 200? Yeah, not sure. Anybody, I don't know if anybody's read the books out there, but feel free to let us know. But hey, it's kind of cool not knowing anything about the books. Listen, I didn't even see the trailer. So I didn't know what any of this stuff was about when uh, I was going into it. And I think I tried to avoid the trailer a little bit because uh, I saw a little bit and already it wasn't, it had no dialogue. Uh, they weren't telling you a big story here. So I didn't really know what this was, this was about. So the trailer's not even giving that much away. But looking at this, I'm surprised at what they did with this movie and all the different things that are coming together to make this film. So watching this film and, uh, and uh, early on, my first impressions of it were, uh, this is a traditional family movie. Now, you know, I know you're looking at robots and hanging out with animals and whatnot, and there's, you know, probably a little science fiction element to it right there. But man, this is this is a very much a traditional family animated film, you know, and that's a subgenre that's almost looked down on. And that subgenre would be the cute talking animal movie. Okay, is that what you mean? Because to me, <laughs> I thought maybe you were implying that this could be like a movie where it's for the whole family, but it's one where the parents could walk out liking it more than the kids. No, that's true. But I'm talking more like something that's looked down upon, which is the cute talking animal movie. You know, because you look at this, that's you're looking at it and you're seeing that there are no animals talking. Those animals talk their ass off in this movie. Yeah. Oh, and that oh, was oh. the thing with the trailer was that some of it, they weren't talking. And then the second trailer, the animals start talking. Okay. So I didn't even see the second trailer. This is the only trailer I saw. So I didn't even know they talked. I got it. And, and that's the thing about the beginning of the movie, like the animals aren't even talking. But when they do, it turns into one of those talking animal movies. And that's something that worried me once those animals got a little chatty mm -hmm. because I don't hate talking animal movies. You know, I love animation of all types as long as it's telling a good story. But, man, you know, a lot of times we get a talking animal movie and it. They, they all do the same thing. And a lot of times it's not really all that great. You know, we'll have uh, all the same character types. You know, you got the you got the cute kid animal. Mm -hmm. You got the smart ass or cranky animal. Yeah. You know, you got you got the weird animal, <laughs> you know, uh, and the, the humor in these movies, man, is it's either too cute or too obnoxious or a combination of both. And a lot of times they, they're like that because they're just trying to sell the movie to kids. They're putting farts and, you know, and, and, and talk and characters that talk loud because they feel like that that's what young kids like. And they're just trying to cash in, especially or maybe a pop song or two. And, you know, and the younger they skew sometimes, the more annoying it is. Um, they're just going for the easy, easy laughs for those things, man. And so thank God that with this movie right here, this never reaches that obnoxious level. And I was waiting for it too. The moment those animals start talking and they already brought up some of the types I was talking about. And they check a lot of the boxes that you mentioned. Yeah, I mean, immediately they had a mom walking by a possum with Catherine Harris' voice and she had uh, uh, seven baby possums and they were all being obnoxiously cute at first. And I was like, okay, here we go. We had a good 10 minutes of these cat of these animals uh, shutting the hell up. And now here they go running their mouths. And I was like, oh my God, uh, th th this isn't gonna go bad. No, it did not. Um, actually, I was surprised at some of the voice work in here. I was surprised at how these animals were not getting on my nerves. And what really takes it out of that, I believe from uh, this being, you know, more of a run of the mill talking animal movie is that it's that element of sci-fi yeah. in here. You know, it's uh, so, you know, this is a uh, this is a robot, and this is again something that we've all seen before. It's the robot that's 
learning how to be human, uh, learning how to actually um, uh, become emotional, how to feel for others and how to and how to feel something for itself. And, you know, we've seen this before. I mean, that was short circuit. Yeah. You know, in a way that was Iron Giant. Or even Wally. Or Wally. Yeah. They, uh, you know, they handle that very well because that's really the emotional part of the story. And that's what this movie thrives on. And, you know, I also like that the sci-fi element creates a really cool world backstory mm -hmm. for this movie. Uh, it forces the movie to kind of take off those kids gloves that you would expect something like a family movie like this to have. And and this movie doesn't like it it goes it crosses the line in ways I've never seen a kids movie do. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a little bit. You know, I'm looking at this though and I'm thinking, you know, as I'm looking at it, I'm like, wow, you know, this 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 world is actually pretty cool because they set up this backstory for this world, which they never explain. They don't give any answers for it. If you're too stupid to figure out for yourself, then that's on you. You know, I'm looking at this and, you know, you can kind of make up your own story for what happened to this world. It feels like humans finally just and climate change happened at its worst. And now nature has taken over and humans are forced into these uh, colonized bubbles. And in a way, you're right, that feels also uh, like Wally. Mm -hmm. You know, except Wally told you pretty much what was going on. Uh, this movie never addresses it. And I thought, you know what? That is cool because, and I love that angle because what you got here is you have a post-apocalyptic movie that completely ignores the apocalypse just to focus on these talking animals. Yeah, I didn't even think of this as a post-apocalypse movie, but it definitely is. Yeah, and they give you hints in the movie of little disasters here and there, but they, you know, they they just keep on going by. It's like it's like we're in the car just rubbernecking the apocalypse. You know, we just they, it never stops to dwell on that. You know, if you see it, that's fine. Put it together for yourself. But we're talking about these animals. We ain't worried about the every, everything else. They don't even do like what Mad Max movies do at the beginning, you know, like radio snippets. It's like there is zero exposition and it doesn't need it. No, no, not at all, man. But, you know, really. Above everything I just said. Talking animal movie, family film, sci-fi movie, post-apocalyptic film. That's a lot to have in one movie, especially for kids out there. But they have it all. And believe it or not, it, it's kind of all working. But the reason why it's working is because above all of that. Listen, it's funny how you can blend all these unlikely elements together as long as you have emotion. Mm -hmm. That is the main thing that holds this movie together and pulls all these unlikely elements together to make it click. This is a movie that is about family dynamics. It's about parenting and it's about community. Yeah. People are like, man, I can't handle all this. That's way too much for one movie. <laughs> it is, it really is, but it's working. Yeah. You know, the, the way that this made me think about just growing up and like gave me insight, I felt like on what it would yeah. like, what it would be like to be a mom. I was shocked. Yeah. It made me want to adopt <laughs> when I got up. <laughs> It was like, I'm 53 years old. I had, you know, I felt selfish. This movie made me feel like a dick for not having kids. Cause I was <laughs> it like, made me feel like, hey, I hope all the parents who brought their loud, obnoxious kids are paying attention. This is how you do it. They should have learned from this robot. <laughs> they didn't learn a damn thing. They were too busy laughing at the characters farting. I wish they had, you know, I, I wish we had more robots than human moms out there after this. Amen. But you know, it said it made me, made me not want to be a dad, made me want to be a mom. <laughs> You know, I wanted to put on fake breasts with milk and all that kind of stuff, man. I, mean, I felt like, wow. Uh, somebody said, you have kids, Julie. <laughs> that doesn't count. I want to adopt from a young age and not this Julie right here talking about Julie and yeah, Green. Yeah. I don't want to adopt no damn 26-year-old black dude. I want, a, I want a baby. I walked out wanting to get pregnant. <laughs> you try and feed him his bottle. It's like, where's the buzz balls at? Oh, but you know, it made me really want to go home and just hug my baby even more, man. I was like, wow. I, I saw this, this moment in the movie right here. This right here. And... I went home and just tried to recreate the same thing right there, <laughs> which she's just kind of like, get off me, dad. <laughs> this is embarrassing. This is weird. It's creepy. Are you come looking in my ear? <laughs> yeah. Hey, come on. Let's do, let's do the goose and robot thing. Come on. Come on. Let's do it. Yeah. Just stop, dad. <laughs> that whole thing about parenting 
and family. When I say family dynamics, you know, they show you that family can be anything. It could be a married couple. It could be a married couple of any type. It could be a person just being assisted by a friend. Yeah. You know, it really does drive home that family is not always uh, traditional. Family is not always blood. Family is about love and support. Mm -hmm. It sounds cheesy, people I know, but this is a, this is th this thing worked that way, man. That's where the real heart of the movie is, and it's so emotional that so many people are crying in the movie. Oh yeah, movies sound like a bunch of sniffing dogs when they just in the dark. You just are. <laughs> And I saw people, I, I was looking too, I saw people with silhouettes getting tissues and wiping eyes. And I was like, man, this movie is really affecting people. Yeah. You know, and this relationship with the, so the robot's name is Roz. And she eventually names the, the, the little goose Bright Bill. And, you know, I mean... Uh, I don't know the, who played the goose, but Lupita Nyong'o plays Roz. Yeah, Lupita Nyong'o plays Roz. And I had the name of the guy that played uh, uh, Bright Bill when he gets older. I think it's his voice. I'll tell you that in a little bit. But man, that mo and see, that's the thing. This relationship with Roz and, Bl and, and Bright Bill, they are doing something I don't like movies to do. It's completely manipulative. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's completely manipulative. They, they are controlling us from head to toe, and they know what they are doing. You know, when they have that... When, when they snuggle together and all that, you know, they know exactly what they're doing, man. But... The key to it is that you can be manipulative. That's what movies are supposed to do. Oh yeah. Movies are supposed to make us feel something. The, the only reason why manipulation is bad is when it's cheap. Yeah, lazy. You need to go on an emotional roller coaster, whatever that emotion may be, it just has to work. Yeah. If you're trying to manipulate people for like, uh, you know, uh, uh, an unearned emotion, you just want an instant right there and you're not putting the work, that's when it's bad. You know, you could be manipulative and earn that because, you know, I'm looking at this right here and this is written with a lot of nuance, man. You know, uh, it's not so much milking emotions out of like, like right here. It's not so much trying to milk uh, emotions out of cute imagery like this, you know, with animals hugging each other and a baby bird snuggling. You know, nah, man, you know what, the, what, what it's really doing is that it's getting a lot of emotion and especially if you're a mother. It's got a lot of emotion from people out there because the real experience that we're going through is with the main character of Roz, with her learning to be a mother and, and eventually grow into a protector for everyone. And also a friend to uh, this lonely fox that's, that's voiced by Pedro Pascal. Yes. But when you see how it all starts to work together and how, again, these characters are written with the depth and care that they have, uh, it does, it, it transcends everything that we think might be, you know, all the stuff that we've seen before. So what are you gonna name him? Bright. Bill. Bright Bill. Is that satisfactory? Bright Bill? Processing. <laughs> you know, cause I know y'all looking at this and you're thinking, all right, you know what? This is so cheesy. And you, you, you said it wasn't obnoxious, Corey. Look, this is so obnoxiously sweet and cute. I'm getting diabetes just listening to you describe this movie and looking at these clips right here, man. But I'm telling you, it's all written with real depth and even complexity. Yeah. And that means that, you know, it earns all those emotions. I know some, somebody said, all right, this is just turning me off. Trust me. It's doing the thing that good sci-fi does and reflecting real life in it. And they do it in a way where, I mean, the character development is one thing, but the relationship between these characters and and the way that you see Roz like get into being a mom, yeah. the way they lead into that is, I think, why it's so successful. No, I think so, too. You know, people, I'll tell you, people are emotionally invested in this because the movie knows how to build up those emotional moments. You know, it's not rushing it. It's not trying to put it out there too soon because, you know, we got to move quick. No, it's taking its time. And, you know, the thing with this is that these animals don't like Roz. You know, they say she's the monster in the woods that popped up. And they don't even like little, uh, they don't Bright like Bill. Uh, Bright Bill because, they, you know, she's a monster. You hanging out with her ass. So you must be a monster too, you know. But, uh, but as our parenting skills start to extend to the animal community, you know, they, all the animals start to warm up to her in their own way. And it's surprisingly touching, man, because you really don't see it coming and you expect the worst out of everybody. And then some animal will do the, the sweetest 
act of kindness. And my big ass was in there. I had, I had to cover my mouth because I was almost about to let out a, oh, <laughs> that was so sweet. I could tell that there was one character that you were a little more partial to than the others. And they, they have like a sweet moment. I think that's what you're talking about. Man, you got me. I didn't think it was. I think I don't know what I did to give that away. I don't want to say it in uh, out loud, but can okay. you give me a hint? Uh, like, yes, you do do that again. Yeah. <laughs> How did you know? The way I can tell when you like something because you'll the way that you'll laugh at something. Okay, you know me too well then we, because I mean I've been seeing movies all year with you. Man, that moment got me right here. <laughs> Cause I was not that's the character I was talking about. I not expect it. I said, Oh shit, watch out for that one. <laughs> they up to no good. And then they turn around and did that, I was like, Oh my God. I felt bad for thinking the worst. And it was it led to like a nice creative choice. You know, so many story layers to this. A lot of subplots. But they all get their proper attention. They all get their follow through. You know, other movies would crumble under all these subplots, man. I just say, not even finish them. Uh, that was not to pick on this movie because the movie's doing well and I'm happy for it, but Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice proves, or this movie proves exactly what I had a problem with Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice has so many subplots and just drops some of them out of nowhere. This one has so many subplots that a normal movie could not even handle. And yet they are able to do it all and give it all proper attention and all proper follow through. You know, the, the beginning of the movie uh, is introduced like a short film when Roz first arrives at the forest because uh, it has no dialogue. It's a lot of visual stuff going on. The only person that might talk is Roz. Uh, Bright Bill's migration to the movie is a Rocky film almost with sci-fi action going on. <laughs> I didn't see it like that, but I can see it now. You know, all those montages and everything, yeah. man. Uh, and then, even up to when we get to the third act and we got the climax coming, man, they're still introducing new things. They're introducing, uh, they're introducing new villains at that point. Are those your parents? I know predators and those are predators. And I am a wild robot. Oh, oh man, I want to do that in the theater too. <laughs> that that sh When they say the title of the movie, that is very, that, that is difficult to pull off. I didn't think they quite pulled it off there. I thought that was stupid. No, I understand, I understand. <laughs> I don't care. I, normally, no, no, normally I hate that too. When they say the title of the movie, that really irks me. It, man, this movie was, it was, it, it was, it was getting to, to my heart so much that I did not mind. God, you love this movie. I really do. I really do, man, like, you know, Everything serves a purpose in this movie, man, to serve the story. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, and I, you're, you know me, man. Like I said, I can, I. I you love cartoons. I, I, you know what I love more than cartoons? Oh, what? A good script. Okay, yeah. I can let things slide story-wise if, you know, a movie's trying to do something uh, other than that or if a movie's trying to do too much and it's, you know, it's still entertaining. But you know, everything here is used for story, man. Are to an ant to are to in, to, to enhance an old format, which I've talked about this. You know, being the, the very much a traditional family film, and I loved how sci-fi was used with this, man. To like they used sci-fi in here, not just as a background element, as you know, to add a little edge to the movie. Like again, here's an example of how they worked into the story. They uh, they use it to explain why the animals talk. Yeah. And that was one of my favorite things. I think the first half of this movie I liked more than the second half because that was that was feeling like more uncharted territory. But as it went on, there was never anything that truly surprised me. Like all the beats that it hit, I was like, yep. And then this is going to happen and then it happens. And then it's something else that I knew exactly was going to happen. Yeah. But it was still, regardless, very entertaining the whole time. And I did enjoy the script. Yeah, I... Listen, I've seen a, I see a lot of movies and, you know, I, 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 I'm always impressed when a movie is tight. And I'm, usually a movie's tight when it's trying to handle, the, you know, the bare minimum. You know, they got maybe two, maybe three things going on, something they can manage. You know, this movie has so much going on and it still remains very tight. And I love that, man. And another thing I loved about it, and you already mentioned some of this, the voice acting. Voice acting is great in here. Um... You know, uh, uh, we'll get into Lupita Nyong'o as Roz in a little bit, but I'll mention, uh, 
I'll mention uh, uh, Pedro Pascal as Fink. Fink the Fox. I didn't know that was Pedro Pascal at first. Almost unrecognizable. He's really acting. Well, listen, there's a reason why, because I'm just like y'all, because people are like, God damn, Pedro, sit your ass down, man. He's everywhere. Yeah. But I can kind of see why, because he really does have a lot of range. And now, you know, we can hear that just from the voices alone. You think about what he did in Game of Thrones, you know, get his head crushed and scream, and then you take a, you take what he do, plus he had the accent, then you take Joel, and now you listen to him as Fink the Fox. And and what I've noticed is he's very good with his voice. Like he, the Mandalorian sounds nothing like this fox. Yeah. And this fox sounds nothing like how he's going to sound in Gladiator 2. I didn't even think about him in The Mandalorian, yeah. you know, but his, his voice work is just, and it's a reflection of him as an actor. The man just has a lot of, lot of range, you know, and I can, you know, I can see why he's everywhere. Uh, and I did enjoy his voice, but I would say that uh, Lupita Nyong'o, Lupita Nyong'o is uh, the real, she's the, the, the real talent here, you know, and I, and, and it's not, I'm not saying that she's better because of somebody else because she's more talented than like Pedro Pascal or anybody else. But this character requires her to have the uh, the trickiest job. Yeah, her material shines through the strongest for sure. Well, it's a character that has to has to find her humanity while also maintaining that rigid mechanical voice. Exactly. How can you be rigid and very emotionally human at the same time? And she has to find that middle ground. And it also has to convince us that she feels, you know, one of the greatest emotions of all, which is love. And, you know, she she did it. You know, the, the character does the character doesn't become. That's one of the things I liked about it. The character doesn't become uh, wacky or the character doesn't become, you know, something where it becomes too human for laughs or to make us feel like, oh, if she doesn't become human, then we can't connect. No, she remains a robot through the whole thing. It's like watching Siri have an emotional arc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's true. Actually, I kind of find Siri. <laughs> <laughs> or like Alexa or something. Yeah, Alexa, yeah. I don't want these voices to get to the point where, <laughs> did you hear that? Where I'm, I'm joking a little bit right now, but did you hear where there was, a, there was an AI and this blind dude was talking to the AI? I mean, that makes sense. But the AI was like describing things to this blind dude about the environment and where they were at. And it had all these... Uh, all these little disfluencies, like, you know, doing a, mm, well, let me see. Over here, I see that we have uh, a chestnut stand and a guy is selling chestnuts right now. Over here, we, and it sounded like they were on a date. Wow. So it was like her. It was like the her. Blind guy. That's it crazy. Like, I laughed at her, but it sounded like they were on a date and she was just showing him everywhere. And I was like, man, I'd kind of fall for this. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's kind of cool, though. I mean, like, hey, whatever gets your rocks off and makes you happy. Yeah, look at, look, but it, you know, they weren't on a date. It was just the AI telling the blind guy what was going on. But I was like, it sounds like she's into him. <laughs> and I was like, when they get to that point, I might start trying to, you know, uh, get with a damn AI myself. She's going to be like, I love you. Wow, you feel like a hockey puck. Yeah. <laughs> well, hey, man, a human didn't work out. I might as well date a phone. You know? yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, but that's, you know, uh, but it doesn't go to that point where, you know, the AI and Moraz it sounds more human. She remains a robot and they still manage to convince you that she feels emotions for everything in this forest right here. That was amazing to me. You know, the animation in this, the animation, I know you and I probably split on this, man. A little bit. Because, and I see why, because the animation, the look in this movie is nothing new. Uh, we've seen, it was, there was a point where it was new and we've seen movies kind of push it. This movie's, it's not pushing that. It's, and what I'm talking about is that dry brush acrylic look where they try to make the, the characters, they put textures on the characters to match the, to match the backgrounds. And it looks very much like a dry, dry brush paint job. Uh, I'm not, look, every movie to me does not need to create a new look. Story is what you need to be thinking of, you know, the, unless the visuals are really, really, really that important. Uh, but I like the style in this. I liked it. It's just that this is the way that I've decided to put it. This movie, watching it, I felt like it was in 720p. I wanted to see, there's a lot of detail. I wanted more detail. I wanted to see like the inconsistencies in those brush strokes, you mm -hmm. know? And if they would have made it look 4K with the detail that I wanted, I would have liked this a lot more, I think. But it does come across a little bit generic. And like you said, they didn't take it far enough for yeah. me. Yeah, you, 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 somebody in the chat said something you said, it looks like Puss in Boots. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, like I said, I. 
I was fine with the, the animation, but everybody has a different opinion on those yeah. things, you know. And, but the other thing that made me just get past the look, which I don't think I'm saying it's like it's bad. I don't think there's anything wrong with the look at all. But I thought the animation itself was cool, especially with Roz, you know, because I like the way Roz was able to twist, contort her body to mimic the other animals and move around like them or get herself out of tight situations. You know, I thought the animation was just really creative with her. And they they do some classic stuff with parts of her body that I appreciated. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, listen, I, I love this movie, man. I, you know, I, I look at this and I think that it's a movie that it hits you in the heart more than any animated movie this year, probably even more than Inside Out 2. And I love Inside Out 2. Now, Inside Out 2, you know, that's a sequel. and I'm not holding that against it either, but, you know, it was kind of repeating itself in certain parts. Still very good, though. I think it's one of the best of the year. But I think I might like this just a little bit more because, you know, I, not only do I think that this has more heart than any other animated film this year or... You know, I think it has more heart than a lot of live action movies that we've seen this year. I think it's beautifully told while also giving, you know, giving us a lot of action, a lot of humor and a lot of fun characters. Uh, and though some of these characters feel played out, like we acknowledge right here, you know, I think it's an original blend of all these story types. Yet underneath it all is still a very simple and old fashioned. And here's the important thing. A, listening? Timeless. Mm. I think with all this stuff going on, this is a timeless movie. You, We can watch this movie 100 years right now, and what's working at this moment will work then. This, you know, this is, this is why some Disney movies still maintain from decades upon decades ago, because it is very, you know, just emotionally simple storytelling. And making a sci-fi timeless is tricky. But they, they do pull it off. I do agree. And man, listen, yeah, so it's just, you know, there's so much tenseness going on. And, you know, every generation says this, every person says this. There's so much tenseness and craziness and cruelty in the world. We need a movie like this now. That's what someone said in the chat. But I 100 percent agree. You know, we all need to just stop acting a fool. <laughs> stop being crazy for a moment. Stop reading all this bad news. Put all that shit down and go look at the wild robot. And just see a, a robot bringing all these people together in one big loving community. This uh, this movie made me feel so good. It made me feel so. It made me. It just and, and, it, and it, it moved me so much. And also, and it didn't move me just because of the emotional uh, qualities of this, but because I really do love this script. I think it's such a, a well written script. I think it's such a well and beautifully told story. Let me just shut up and give my rating right now. It's a high, very high full price for me. Wow. Okay. Well, one thing that we didn't talk about, which I did not like, was the ending of this movie, where it felt, I mean, a lot of this feels felt predictable to me, which isn't a bad thing. Like, once you see enough movies, they're, they almost all become predictable in a way. But the end of this movie, did you get the feeling of them trying really hard to set up a sequel? Because that's what I got from this. Like, it really was beating me over the head well, with it. The books have a sequel. <laughs> yeah, I'm not trying to be an that. asshole, man, but the, but it's three books, man. <laughs> yeah, but there were there were opportunities for them to like close this book, you know, without being like, oh, next time, ah, ah. they really like hammer that in. I thought, oh, I don't want to say what I thought because it will, it might be giving away too much, even if I keep it uh, very simple, but. I, I let me just say I thought it ended on a good note that gives you the opportunity to either go to a sequel, make one of these books in the next movie, or you could look at it like, all right, that's a very fine ending right there. You can you you can you know you 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 can leave it there and you know and and still walk away feeling fulfilled. Well, you can have that opinion, and I'll tell you <laughs> that for me, it felt like they're going, hey, ah, number two, huh? Ah, ah. But it's still, it's an enjoyable animated movie to watch. I think that all the character designs are great. I think that if they make another one, just really lean into that art style and make it look almost more like Puss in Boots. But I get it, you know, they're both DreamWorks movies. They didn't want it to look that much like that one, probably. Oh, and let me just say another thing with this, man. You know, because I think one of the things that's important here is that, listen, um, and I, I, I should... I, I want to make sure this goes into my review when it goes up on uh, when it goes up on, on YouTube, because I said this all sounds too sweet. 
And at some points it might be for you. Uh, but fortunately, there's something there to offset that. Uh, because the movie has its fair share of dark moments. Oh, uh, yeah. Forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah. you Man, I missed something. You told me something in the movie. I was like, they did what? Yeah. How did there, I miss that? There is no exaggeration. There is gore in this movie. I, you know, and listen, man. You know, I could say that it has dark moments, including the humor. But I think the movie is just honest. Yeah. I think, you know, it's saying nature's rough. Things die. The movie, Circle of you, life. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, the movie doesn't shy away from that. The main plot is kicked off by death. I won't say what, but it's that's the whole. That's the reason why we get going because of a of, of like a very tragic death, by the way. More than one, I would say. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's and it's pretty rough, man. It's like it's 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 rougher than what you think right now. You already are saying, oh, I know what they do. Now, yeah, this goes a little bit further, uh, but it has a practical attitude about it. It even had that that it even had that uh that 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 head shake moment. You know the head shake moment where you're like when somebody oh. looks over at something it's like, mm mm. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? Like the movie is like you nasty. How dare you? Oh uh, no, it's like they didn't make it. Oh, mm -hmm. I see. I yeah. see. Or uh, they gone. Oh yeah, they had. Did you see that moment? No, in yeah, I I see what you're saying now. Yeah, but yeah. but the I'll tell you this: the dark humor in this, if you want to say that, it is really funny, man. Uh, that's the other thing about the emotional moments in this. It's gonna make you feel like a real asshole when you start laughing at some of the mean parts of the movie because <laughs> it's not it's not as sweet as I'm trying to make it sound. There really are some uh, some dark and funny moments in here, and and they are genuinely funny. Uh, so yeah, man, you know, it's, uh, like I said, I gave my rating already. You go ahead. Well, I think that I, I agree with pretty much everything that you did say. And I think that one of the things that helps this movie shine is that even though it is science fiction, it still holds it to a very grounded level and makes it all feel very believable. Yeah. And, and it does feel like a reflection of our life today and, and the future that we could have in a lot of ways. Uh, I didn't like it nearly as much as you, but when I was reflecting on it and talking to you about it right now, I would definitely say I would give it a very, very, very low full price. Oh. I think that there's just there's too much of this that's really smart, you know, to to not give it the credit where credit is due. It's cliche. There's mm -hmm. ideas in here that I never need to see again in a movie. And it's not this movie's fault that they did it. But it's like, you know, you're going to have an evil robot. Maybe he's going to have that eye like Hal 9000, mm -hmm. even though we never need to see that shit again. I'd give it a low, low, low full price. I was almost going to give it a super high matinee. But no, I, I do love the designs of it, even okay. though I think the animation is lacking in some places. All right. All right. Somebody said I saw that. <laughs> All right. I take it back. I take it back. You, you, I thought, uh, I thought you were going to go with a matinee, but you gave it a full price. Yeah. You know, I, when you, uh, when you were saying, I don't like it as much as you do. I kind of got an itch and just <laughs> accidentally just kind of scratched like this. You know, that was, I was, I didn't mean to, but you know, just, <laughs> but you know what? I, I take it back, man. I'll, I'll scratch with the right thing in there. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, t I take it back. I take it all That's back, man. Too, man. <laughs> oh, oh, man, come on. <laughs> Let's come together. The wild robot would not like this. No, no, no. no. You know, they had a moment like this in the movie. She'd be disappointed. Yeah, I Let's, know what they would like, a USB port. See, <laughs> this is why we can't be a community, man. This is why we can't be a community. And one thing I want to say. You I learn nothing <laughs> from this movie. <laughs> man, Mark Hamill. As that bear, like you heard That's him right. in there, I was like, he does not sound like how he normally does. Mark, it. Mark Hamill is in a lot of things where he doesn't sound like himself. Uh, let me see here. So yeah, there's a, there's a, uh, there 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 he is. And let's uh, tell you what, let's uh, let's let's listen to it. You can hear it for yourself. No predators, and those are predators. Acknowledge return command. Tell them you're already home. Yeah! And that was Ving Rhames as the bird. But yeah, Mark Hamill, uh, I don't know if they pitch shipped his voice or manipulated it uh, with, uh, you know, with digital, the software or whatever. digitally or something. Maybe they might have, but Mark Hamill has done a lot of things where he doesn't sound like himself. Have you seen, you need to, you probably did see it. Did you see, um, it was the show on Netflix where it was the the curse for that family it was based off of Edgar Allan Poe oh, story. 
Uh, someone mentioned that to me today. No, I haven't seen that though. Mark Hamill's in there. He's a lawyer for this family. And he comes in, he sounds just like a cranky, tired old man. So yeah, he, uh, you know, he's, that dude has gotten a lot of range too. Yeah, he's great. I, so, I think, uh, uh, Fall of Usher, House of the Fall of House Usher. House of Usher, yeah. yeah House of it. Usher. Yeah. yeah. That, I mean, all the actors are good. Even R Ving Rhames has some moments as that bird that are pretty great. Yeah, yeah, man. I'm telling y'all, don't listen to this man. Go see, <laughs> you get a full price. I don't care. Don't listen to this man. Go see this movie right here. Brilliant film, I thought. One of the one of the best of the year. Well, I'm just, I'm glad you enjoyed it though. That'll make your top ten. Look at that, I, man. It better make my top ten the way I'm talking. <laughs> People will beat the shit out of me if I don't make it part of my top ten. The way I built this movie. Up. I mean, and the way that you do top tens, uh, technically top fifty, but <clears throat> let's begin, <laughs> shall we? <laughs> Well, you made it to the end of the video. That must mean you really like what we do. So if you do, check out these other videos just like this one. Check out our other YouTube channels and subscribe to join our wonderful Toasty community. And as always, stay toasty.